Hello students, this is evolutionary reasoning and today I want to tell you about the breeder's equation but I don't want to get into the math of it. I, I kind of want to give a cartoon account and it'll help a lot with um, the reading for next week. So here's what I said last time. When there is heritability and phenotypic selection then evolution will occur. Uh, this is a little bit sloppy. We would have to say directional phenotypic selection and some other things in there, but basically that's the idea. Now we can take this number one and number two and then break it down. So I'm going to break it down so that there's some little other parts of it. So this means exactly the same thing. It's just more words. So 1A would be when variation in traits exists, like the height of an organism. And then 1B, when that variation is partially caused by genetic differences. And actually, I mean particulate genetic differences, that is, different alleles at a locus, and maybe more, more than one locus is possible, too. Uh, and then I can take number two, and I can also break it down. When fitness varies, and fitness, again, is something like the number of successful offspring that an individual has. So when one uh, mother differs from the next mother in how many offspring she produces, that would be fitness varies. And then 2B is when uh, the variation in fitness is partially related to the variation in traits. So in other words, shorter organisms make more offspring and taller ones make uh, fewer offspring. That would be this kind of relationship where the variation in fitness is related to the variation in the traits. It's because of the variation in traits. So when those four conditions hold, then allele frequencies and the averages of the traits would evolve across the generations, assuming there's no other complications. Now, we can add some additional conditions that would make this evolutionary process all but inevitable. Um, so I've numbered those three, four, and five. When environments change, and you'll remember last time I talked about the population moving from a continental arid environment to a island that's more humid, so that would be a change in the environment. Also something that helps is when populations produce more offspring than can possibly survive. And pretty much all species have the capability of producing more offspring than can possibly survive. It's just sort of a, a feature of mathematics that if uh, organisms reproduce, they multiply. And if they multiply, then populations can grow multiplicatively. Uh, and if you take two elephants, and make four elephants, and those four elephants make eight elephants, and those eight elephants make 16 elephants, then pretty soon you've got more elephants than can possibly survive. That isn't to say that populations um, do produce more offspring than can possibly survive. They don't, and the reason why is because they don't have unlimited resources. And then I'll add five. Given enough time, mutations are nearly inevitable, uh, and mutations increase genetic variation. So they provide more variation in those traits that can then be selected on. And that variation can be tiny when it starts out, because it's only affecting one individual. But then, uh, if it's selected for, then it rises up in frequency, and so you get more and more variation, until you get less and less. And that's when it goes to fixation, when that new mutation has now swept throughout the whole population. Once everybody has that new mutation, then that variation uh, has disappeared from the population. But it's made the thing different than its ancestors were. So anyway, if you add all this stuff up, then uh, it becomes um, more and more plausible that you'd have allele frequencies changing and the averages of traits changing across generations. Okay, um, now traits like height we call quantitative traits and they're usually underlain by 
uh, many genes of small effect. And so again, we can kind of summarize this as heritability and phenotypic selection. And heritability and phenotypic selection then leads to evolution. And I've been glossing over these words a lot, so I think it's time to provide kind of some graphical almost definitions that you can hold on to. So here are my little graphs. And let's go through these definitions. So heritability, which is sometimes symbolized h squared. Don't worry about the squared <coughs> part. That's from statistics. It's always h squared. Like, don't ever take the square root of h squared. Uh, heritability is the relationship between uh, traits in offspring and traits in parents. So if you were to go out and measure the beaks of a bunch of birds, and then you keep track of um, which birds are parents and then which birds are offspring, and you keep on keeping track of that until the next generation, and then you measure the beaks of the offspring, then you could relate the size of the beaks of the offspring to the size of the beaks of their parents. And the slope of that line is related to heritability. So heritability you could derive from the slope of that line. Um, phenotypic selection can be expressed in various ways. Uh, one way is the phenotypic selection differential, which is uh, symbolized capital S, and it's the relationship between traits and fitness. So I uh, have there a little graph, and you can see there's a sort of salmon-colored um, uh, bell-shaped curve, and that's meant to symbolize the distribution of the trait sizes in the parents. So if it were beak sizes, it would be you've got all of these parents, you measure their beak sizes, some of them are smaller and some of them are larger, and you get some kind of distribution, which wouldn't have to be bell-shaped, it could be anything, but I uh, symbolized it as bell-shaped. And that's in the parent generation. And that's counting the parents that survived and the parents that didn't survive, the parents that reproduced and the parents that didn't reproduce. So that's before selection. That's the beak sizes before selection is hit. <coughs> then if you also um, figure out the parents that actually gave rise to offspring and you figure out their beak sizes, then you get the purple bell-shaped curve and you see it's um, a little bit more to the left side and it's smaller than the salmon-shaped curve. So it's a subset of the salmon-shaped curve, right? So the beaks of the birds that actually reproduced, it's a subset of the beaks of all of the birds in their generation. And because we have phenotypic selection and it's directional, that purple distribution is moved over relative to the salmon distribution. See, its average is smaller than the average of all of the birds before they reproduced. And the selection differential is the difference between the averages of those two distributions. So that's one way to think of phenotypic selection. Another way to think of phenotypic selection is the relationship between the traits and fitness. So if we put on the x-axis the trait of the parents, and then we put fitness, the number of offspring the parents ultimately successfully rear, then I'm postulating that there's a, a scatter there, the, the black circles, a scatter there that gives a directional relationship, and that would be a selection gradient. So that's another measure of phenotypic selection. If you combine heritability and selection, and you're just, actually all you're doing is taking h squared and multiplying it times s, then you get response to selection, or evolution, which is symbolized r, response to selection. And that's something that happens to populations. It's not what happens to individuals, like the individuals aren't changing at all in my little model, but the population is changing, and it's changing in allele frequencies, and it's changing in the average of the trait from one generation to the next. And that's that little arrow, that little black arrow. So the salmon distribution is the distribution of the trait in the parental generation, and the blue distribution is the distribution of the trait in the offspring 
generation, you see it's changed a little bit. It's, they've gotten smaller. Okay, so now I'm going to use my equation to imagine how we could have uh, the change in the size of hippos. So we have here two generations of hippos, parents and offspring, and uh, I am, for the sake of argument, thinking that we have really strong selection, that there's a 10% difference between the size of hippos as a whole and the size of hippos who actually get to be parents. So there's a selection differential of 10%. And then I'm imagining kind of a very ordinary heritability of one third. And if you do that, you get a little bit of a change from one generation to the next. I'm not sure you can notice it, but then let me add another round of selection. So now we've got the grandchildren hippos, grand hippos, the grand hippos and the great grand hippos and the great-great-grand hippos, and the great-great-great-grand hippos, and so on. Uh, and so I just keep on doing this for 10 generations. So that's 10 generations of very, very strong selection, the type of selection that you would exact if you were breeding hippos. Um, and this is what you get. So there's the beginning hippo and there's the end hippo after 10 generations of very strong selection. Um, you would get the same thing if you had weak selection instead of 10%, 1% selection um, for 100 generations. So I did it for 10 generations just because I didn't want to sit here for 100 generations. But if I had done it for 100 generations with just 1% selection, 1% selection, that's less selection than you would normally be able to measure in the wild, like 1% is not a very easy thing to measure, then after only 100 generations, you would have this much change in any quantitative trait like hippo height. Also, if you had 100 generations instead of 10, then that provides more time for new mutations to arise, and new mutations are ultimately necessary uh, to have evolution, although you can get quite a bit of evolution without any new mutations, just using the standing variation in any large population. But ultimately, you would need more new mutations to take it to more extreme values. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> here's the kind of thing that I want to get across. Almost all dimensions and concentrations, like for instance, the concentration of protein in corn or the concentration of sugar in eggplant, um, almost all dimensions and concentrations have genetic variation that's like this, this kind of heritability. For such quantitative traits, consistent directional selection over a thousand generations would result in very, very dramatic evolution, the type of evolution that we would wake up and notice. Um, a thousand years, if we're just talking, you know, about organisms that reproduce in one year, or a hundred thousand years, if you want to talk about organisms that take a hundred years to reproduce. Either a thousand years or a hundred thousand years is almost nothing in geological time. So our common ancestor with chimps, we don't know when it was, but it could have been four and a half million years ago, or it could be seven million years ago, but it's, sort of, it's definitely a long time ago. Um, the Cenozoic started 65 million years ago. That's when the last of the dinosaurs bit the dust, except for birds. Um, the Mesozoic started 225 million years ago. The Paleozoic when at, the, at the beginning of the Paleozoic, you had this radiation of complex multicellular organisms, which probably is associated with an increase in the amount of oxygen in the environment. Um, the Paleozoic started 570 million years ago. And those things are just like orders of magnitude more than you need uh, in order to get the evolution of very dramatic differences. And life began, of course, 3.5 billion years ago. So time is absurdly <coughs> plentiful 
to explain evolution. Um, now, of course, it's not just one trait that changes. Many traits change because they're all partially correlated with one another. Um, and then more importantly, uh, the relative proportions of the animal change because selection acts on multiple traits as evolution proceeds. So it might be selection is acting uh, on these hip this hippo population, making it smaller and smaller and smaller, maybe because food is scarce. Um, but it also could be acting on uh, the ear size of hippos, making them more and more pointy because they are such logical hippos. We then might ask, well, if we have so much time to make so much evolution, then when uh, does evolution not occur? And some possible reasons can be just seen by looking at those conditions for evolution. So you don't have evolution when the trait in question uh, doesn't vary genetically. For instance, you know, it might be swell to have uh, a, a new a mutation arise that made the organisms able to live forever and reproduce instantly. But that's some kind of a violation of economics, right, to be able to do everything perfectly. Uh, and so that kind of new mutation just doesn't arise. Um, also, directional selection um, might not have been consistent. And that could be for any number of reasons, but they kind of fall into classes. So maybe the environment has changed too much too fast. And when that happens, species don't evolve. They just go extinct. Uh, and they wouldn't have to go extinct throughout their whole range. They could just go extinct in that one place that uh, the environment changed. Another possibility is that evolution um, hasn't occurred because the environment has changed hardly at all. And the reason why the environment might not change hardly at all is because the organisms are tracking their habitat. They're moving around so that they always live in the same environment that they're adapted to. And so the environment uh, is not changing relative to their parents, even though the place that environment is at might be changing. Another reason is the environment has been changing inconsistently back and forth. Sometimes you have drought years. Sometimes you have flood years. It goes back and forth. And so you have a little bit of evolution towards having more fur that's more waterproof, and then you have a little bit of evolution having less fur that's less waterproof, and so on. And then there are um, the, there's the possibility of apparent uh, benefits that trade off with costs. And these cost-benefit trade-offs, you as a naturalist might not be aware of, um, but you know, ultimately that is going to keep things from evolving to be too extreme. If you got giraffes that had necks that were twice as long as they are now, you know, maybe it would just be impossible for them to breathe because they just couldn't get oxygen to their lungs or something like that. Or both. Nature might not have any evolution because nature didn't have the genetics lined up quite right or nature didn't have phenotypic selection lined up quite right. So here's the bottom line. A tiny amount of directional selection over geological time can easily result in the kinds of quantitative differences we see between sister species and from one form to the next as they're found in finely layered fossil beds. Evolution is ridiculously easy to account for, in other words. And that's all that I have to say about that.